Huang Changling, Grievance in the Ever Faithful Palace. I sweep the courtyard as dawn brightens, open the golden hall, then pick up a discarded fan and linger here a while. My beauty must not even be a match for those cold crows flying back from the Chaojiang Palace, still warm from its sun. So, uh, we continue with the Seven Ward Quatrain Yue Fu, and now we have two poems by Wang Changling, a poet that we've already encountered in the anthology. Um, early high Tang, important figure, and uh, one that had a very ample palette and register in poetry. He has traditionally been associated with um, frontier poetry, but uh, he was also very well known and appreciated in his day for poems on the complaints of women, of palace beauties. And the poem that we've read today is a very good example of that. And it's also a historical recreation and impersonation of a figure that is very important in classical Chinese poetry, and one that we've encountered, I believe, already in this anthology. So the first thing would be talking a little bit about the persona uh, the, who is supposed to be the voice of this poem. And this is Concert Ban, uh, Ban Yeju, or Lady Ban. So who is this woman? So this woman was a concubine of the Western Han uh, Dynasty Emperor Cheng, who lived at approximately the same time as Emperor Augustus. So in the last decades, in the last years, before the beginning of the Christian era. And uh, she was, you know, a, a concubine of the emperor. Uh, who rose to prominence at court, but afterwards, uh, you know, the emperor became besotted with other ladies, basically uh, the Zhao sisters, and uh, she was displaced. She was um, expelled, not not expelled directly, but but uh, accusations and slanders from the jealous uh, Chao sisters started piling up against her, and because she was a very smart, cultured lady, she she know she she knew how to be prudent and how to push herself out of, of, of dangerous way, and uh, she, um, she um, sought to become uh, part of the household of the Empress Dowager, that is, of the Empress Mother, and to, you know, get out of the way of, 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 the, of the Shao, of the very dangerous Shao sisters. So she spent her last years serving uh, the Empress Dowager, and uh, she moved out from the imperial palace. And, uh, this is the Western Han Dynasty. The main imperial palace where the emperor lived was the Weiyang Palace. The palace where the Empress Dowager lived was uh, to the east of that. It was the Changle. More specifically, um, uh, our Lady Pan lived in the, in the uh, Changshin Pavilion within that palace. And that's, that's present in the original title of this poem. That is the ever faithful palace is the Shang Xing Pavilion or Palace, and so, so it refers to her. So the title is referring. The title is you know, Lament uh, in the Ever Faithful Palace. So it's referring to Lady Ban's laments while she was at this palace after having been discarded uh, from the emperor's uh, good favors. Um, at the same time, the, the, the name of the podium is very, very significant because she is the ever faithful. So, so the pavilion in which she stays is, um, you know, matches her very appropriately. So Lady Ban's story was very popular. It first appears in a history work that was written only some decades after her death, I believe, uh, in Ban Gu's History of the Western Han Dynasty. Ban Gu, one of the great historians of China, was also her grand uh, nephew, which means that he, you know he probably, we might believe he might be embellishing his uh, great aunt's uh, um, story a little bit, uh, uh, but we, we we are right to believe most of it. Now, in in that story uh, of of in the biography of her of his great aunt, among other things, there is a poem, uh, a full poem, that was allegedly composed by Lady Pan, and we're not going to recite it all, but it's especially interesting. It's a fool. It's not a pair, a she, therefore, 
uh, well, it's not a town poet either, so it would never be included in this anthology. But it's uh, particularly interesting because, of course, that fool is a source for later poems singing about Lady Pan, and there was a great uh, amount of these in the Chinese classical tradition, and, and not only in China. I mean, the story has even been taken for the subject of a no drama in Japan from, from, from the later Middle Ages. So, for example, one of the lines in the, in the Fu says, uh, I serve the Empress Dowager in her eastern palace. Take my place among lesser maids in the palace of lasting trust. I help to sprinkle and sweep among the curtains, and shall do so till death brings my turn to a close. So this reference to sprinkling and sweeping among the curtains is actually taken on by uh, Wang Chengling in this impersonation of this woman in, in mentioning sweeping the courtyard as dawn brightens in the first line. Now, uh, the, the history of the Han Dynasty and that Fu poem are probably original texts uh, written by and about Lady Pan, but as I said, she became a, a literary icon very, very early on. And uh, in fact, her most famous poem is not the Fu that I have just quoted. It's what is generally considered to be the oldest or one of the oldest pentasyllabic poems that have been preserved in the Gushi tradition. And uh, that poem says as follows. Newly cut white satin from chi, brilliantly pure as frost and snow, trimmed to make a fan of shared pleasure. Its round shape recalls the bright moon. Passing in and out of the Lord's embrace, when it is stirred, a breeze arises. But always you fear that the autumn will arrive, and cool winds snatch away the fiery heat. Discarded in a bamboo chest, affection severed halfway. So this is a famous song of resentment. And uh, again, this was attributed to Lady... Pan, but we might be skeptic, skeptics about that. The pentasyllabic genre of poetry, we believe, started in the Han, but we hardly have any evidences until the very late Eastern Han, or even the following period, when the genre started to be accepted by the scholar officials and dignified by uh, individual poets writing in it. And, uh, and you know, later, some later forms, the 19 old poems particularly, were canonized and included in the great literary anthology, the Wen Shuan. This poem was also included in the Wen Shuan. So, um, reading recently a book by Nicholas Morrow Williams about another poet, uh, Jiang Jiang, who was a, uh, one of the main creators of, of Six Dynasties, Imitation Poetry, he talks about uh, this, this poem at large, and uh, he mentions that this poem was probably not composed in, by Lady Ban. It was in, an impersonation, and, and he mentions that, you know, early pentasyllabic poetry that has been preserved to us, um, a lot of the times were impersonations or recreations of an oral uh, poetry tradition that, that was previous to, to the, the period of this union, that is from the Han, but which was lost. Anyway, this poem during a lot of centuries was actually considered genuine uh, work of Lady Ban and was very appreciated, and it's a nice piece of of craftsmanship. So, so the image of the poem that you have just heard, this idea of, of mm, the, the concubine comparing herself to a fan, a beautiful round white fan, which is used in the summer but discarded in autumn when the heat has gone away, you know, is a very, very eloquent and, and, uh, and artful metaphor for the concubine herself, who had her time of glory under the sun uh, of the emperor's summer, but is now in, in, in suffering the coldness of the emperor and of a metaphorical autumn, and is no longer a fan being kept in use. Uh, anyway, uh, this image also appears in Wang Changling's poem. Again, he, he is writing an impersonation in the voice of um, Consort Pan, of Lady Pan, and uh, the, the discarded fan appears in the second line. Yeah, uh, then pick up a discarded fan and linger here a while. So, of course, this poem is, you know, really, really going um, straight ahead and full swing into intertextuality and in quoting in the 
assumed voice of Lady Pan, texts that were genuinely believed to have been written by her and images present in those texts. So after this very long introduction, let's go back to Wang Chengling's take of Grievance in the Ever Faithful Palace. So uh, this is, as we said, is the typical poem of, um, of uh, a grieving uh, palace lady, sad and isolated in luxurious quarters far away from the emperor's love for one reason or other. In this case, it's also a historical poem, because this is not an anonymous concubine or palace lady. This is specifically the famous Lady Pan. And this becomes very clear from the title already, because Grievance in the Ever Faithful Palace, as we mentioned, refers to the Chang Xing Pavilion and connects us automatically with her story. Other indirect references in this poem are those intertextual references we mentioned in lines 1 and 2, also the, the reference to the Chaoyang Palace in line 4, which was the main pavilion in the Western Han Dynasty Emperor's Palace. So it's a, a historical poem, apart from being the, the laments, the griefs of a, a palace lady. So let's take a look at the poem couplet by couplet, as we usually do. So the first couplet, I sweep the courtyard as dawn brightens, open the golden hall, then pick up a discarded fan and linger here a while. So the first poem, the first couplet, sorry, as usual, depicts the scene. It's the morning, it's dawn, and we see the works and the days of the protagonist of this poem. She's sweeping the courtyard like a, a, a good palace lady in the service of somebody superior to her. She opens the golden hall, so golden hall, she's living in the palace, and uh, then picks up a discarded fan and lingers here a while. So, you know, we might imagine, if, if we didn't think about the, his, uh, the, the historical reference in the poem, that, you know, she just has some free time after doing some work, uh, and uh, she takes a fan maybe to fan herself, because it might be hot. But again, the image to the fan is connecting us to the famous Lady Pan pentasyllabic poem. So we have this, this lady in the palace, she has done some work, she's in the palace, she's holding a fan. The second couplet, as usual, moves us into a more subjective uh, stance, although all the poem can be imagined as the words of Lady Pan. But the second one more clearly transmits us her feelings, her feelings of dejection, of, of grievance, as present from the title. My beauty must not even be a match for those cold crows flying back from the Chaoyang Palace, still warm from its sun. So we must imagine that uh, Lady Pan is looking out um, in the direction, in the west, in the direction of the main Imperial Palace. She sees perhaps, or maybe she doesn't see the Chaoyang Palace, but, but she knows it's in that westernmost direction. Um, she sees some um, birds coming from there, and uh, some crows which transmit the image of coldness. But, uh, and, and they're ugly in, in traditional views of, of, of Chinese culture. The ravens are, well, also in the West, uh, they're not generally depicted as a light and beautiful sight to, to behold. So, so the second couplet basically has a sad comparison, like the beautiful lady says, you know, I'm not beautiful. Even these dark birds are prettier than me. Yeah, my beauty is not even a match, the second couplet says, my beauty must not even be a match for those cold crows flying back from the Chaoyang Palace, still warm from its sun. So I'm uglier even than these crows. Of course, this is a conceit. She's not uglier than the crows. But why is she saying that? Because the crows are coming back from the Chaoyang Palace, still warm from its sun. What is the what sun in the Chaoyang Palace? Well, the sun is very obviously a metaphor of the, the emperor's warmth, because the emperor is the one who is in the Chaoyang Palace. And remember, this palace was to the west of Lady Pan, so, so it's clear that it's not the real sun, because this poem is set, well, or at least it starts at dawn. You, know, you could imagine that perhaps the whole day has passed from the first couplet to the second one. But it's more obvious to read that sun, that sun's warmth, that accompanies the Black Ravens, as, you know, they were closer to the emperor than I am living here in this uh, far away pavilion. So, yeah, all in all, 
a very interesting historical take if you are interested in this sort of thing, which I am. I liked it a lot. Uh, just to conclude, I have here another poem, one of the imitation poems uh, that, that try to imitate the style of uh, Lady Barbie's Pentaslavic poem by this uh, Sixth Dynasty poet, Jiang Jiang. And uh, I'm going to read it as well. As you will see, it also includes the image of the fan, of the silk fan, of the round silk fan, and uh, having lost the ruler's favour. So this poem goes like this. Favourite beauty pan, poem on a fan. This fine silk fan is like the round moon, deriving from the white silk of the loom. A painting shows the princess of Chin, who rides a Seymour into smoky haze. Bright colours are most prized by the world, but new ones can never replace the old. I worry that the cool breeze comes and blows on us by the trees on the jade steps. While my Lord's favour has not been used up, I wither and perish midway through the journey.